So if you missed the last 15 minutes, it was the best 15 minutes I've ever lectured. I'm sorry. We had some technical difficulties. So hopefully the next uh, three and a half hours will be all that you've been looking for. Just kidding. We're not going to be talking for that long. All right. For everyone here that just had a heart attack as well. All right. Thank you. I'm Dr. Joe Rafrano. Thanks. We'll try to fill you in on it later. If you have any questions, we'll connect at some point. All right. So uh, ultimately, uh, where did I leave off of that? Last point. Protein. 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 Yeah. So if you have less fat, you're ultimately going to end up with less protein, which leads to high what? Carbohydrates. So when I said low fat, high carbohydrates, we didn't instinctively think that was a good thing. And maybe even back then they would think high carb was good. When you take away one macronutrient and it affects the other one significantly, ultimately you have to eat enough calories. So you're going to ultimately eat more carbohydrates. And then you're told things like Cheerios is the one that lower your cholesterol level. You start consuming that like I did. I eat half, uh, half a box of Cheerios. I had my skim milk with it and a banana and chased it down with a glass of orange juice every day. And I was lean. I was fit. I was active. I was doing well in sports. So it felt great, right? And I'll share a little bit later with you. I'm going to leave a little note for myself. Okay. Uh, I'll just, I won't give you too much info on it. This is just my little trigger to tell you something happened with me when I was 25 years of age, okay, because of some of those choices. All right, so ultimately, this is an important thing to understand how the body works. So it's keeping that blood sugar level down, okay, and not being afraid of the fats, okay? So nowadays, people aren't as afraid because we have keto, right? Keto rocks. Anyone familiar with the ketogenic diet? Okay, so the typical American diet, so of 100% of calories, they might have been consuming... 40 to 60 percent from carbs before right and then maybe proteins were 30 to 40 percent and fats for a good healthy diet would have been about 10 percent because we don't want to get fat right because we do have to hit that point before i go much further fat has more calories in it than carbohydrates and proteins is everyone aware of that there's nine calories enough in a gram of fat, there's four calories in a gram of protein or carbohydrates. So double plus the amount of calories, right? So ultimately, if I eat a diet that's high in fat, I'm talking really high in fat, shouldn't I gain weight? Right? More calories, right? Because calories, too much calories indicates weight gain, right? We've all heard that. So we've all been taught, okay, so who here would disagree with that, okay, that too many calories can make, will make you fat? Okay, and I can understand probably why, okay, because there's some truth and some not so truth to that. If we eat too many of the wrong calories and those ones that are empty nutrients, okay, and they're not carrying with it a lot of nutritional density with it, then it's more likely to contribute to that. But if a person's consuming a lot of calories and they're also feeding a healthy engine, that body, that metabolism in a good way, then the, the, the metabolism will compensate for that by elevating its ability to burn through those. So if, if I'm eating things that really bog down my system and they make it stressed out and it doesn't digest it well and it, it weakens it in some way, I could have a 1,200 or 1,500 calorie diet of garbage versus a two to 3,000 calorie a day with moderate activity diet of, of good, clean fuel. And my body will actually probably maintain a healthier weight with the higher calories. Okay, so that's an important thing to understand as well, because it's not about the calories. I can starve myself at 800 calories a day, but my metabolism will actually slow down. It's like a, a bear goes into hibernation, and it's, you know, if they stated their daily, you know, through the, the summer, you know, caloric intake, they wouldn't, they wouldn't survive the three or four months that they go into hibernation mode, right? Because they would be they'd be burning through thousands of calories probably a single day. If their metabolism goes down almost nothing and they're not moving much at all, then they can live on probably, I don't even know what the number would be, but probably hundreds of calories. And at the end, they've lost a bunch of weight, they're thinned out, and they're ready to go fill up for the next six to nine months, right? Now, what do we do in the winter? We go into hibernation, we're less active, our metabolisms are slowing down. But because we're not doing stuff with our hands that involves holding onto a lawnmower and riding our bike and throwing a ball and stuff, the only thing we can think to put in our hands other than a remote control is food. And then attached to our bodies is a, this thing called the mouth, so we put it in our mouths. So we're actually slowing down our metabolism, our energy expenditure, but we're filling it up with more food. So people put on, during the winter, more weight. Now, most animal species gain weight before winter, and then it burns off, right? Mm -hmm. What do we as people do? We go in pretty lean and mean and ready and walking outside and being active, and then we pack it on during the winter. So we're totally polar opposite of what the other animal species do. 
because we have the convenience of refrigerators, freezers, grocery stores, cars, gyms that get dust on them during the winter and stuff like that. And then when we get bit, you know, like, oh, as soon as spring rolls around, I'll be outside walking more. And that's tough because, you know, 50 to 100 times in a person's life, they go through the cycle of active and inactive and active and inactive versus being, you know, active, maybe, you know, larger amounts and maybe cut down a little bit in the winter. It's just a little bit harder to walk outside, but still it's a way to basically, you know, treat the body. So it's not about calories. It's about whatever supports the metabolism. And when we talk about certain things like Franken food, okay, what do I mean by Franken food? Anyone ever hear of Frankenstein? Was he man-made? Or was he naturally made? He was man-made, right? Okay, Dr. Frankenstein basically made his, his monster. So Franken food is that same creation. It's not the stuff that grows from the earth and you know it came with along with creation, it came along with being made by man. Years ago, if you went to the grocery store, the little IGA, anyone remember that type of store? I know there's still somewhere right around still here. Is one. I mean, yeah, I remember when I grew up, there was this little one. It's probably about three times the size of this room, maybe. And this really intricate, you know, web of aisles to try to maximize it. I couldn't find my way out of it half the time still. But yeah, you know, that's what we did. And we ate. And somehow we survived, right? Now we have stores the size of like the Astrodome, okay, full of foods and all sorts of different things. Now, have that many foods really been discovered? in the last 30 or 40 years, growing out of the ground and walking along the ground and talking to meats and things like that? No. They're packaged, they're processed, they're franken-fooded you know, to death and we're receiving these things. But because they're on a package, they don't have, you know, they're not in a freezer section necessarily. Because remember, you know, if you don't know this already, the best way to shop in a grocery store, unless there's a natural section in the middle, like say Hannaford has, okay, is around the perimeter of the inside of the store. So once you do that, just skip the rest of it unless you got to get laundry detergent. Because if you can find your food in the same aisle as the laundry detergent or very close to it, it's likely to be more packaged. Now, obviously, that's, there are many exceptions. You can find better versions of things canned nowadays, and they use better liners in these things, and flash frozen vegetables and some fruits are good options. But for the most part, that's what's going to be caught around the periphery where it's refrigerated and frozen. Mm -hmm. A lot of the packaged stuff has extra ingredients in it. So if I was going to go and buy canned asparagus, it should have asparagus and maybe water, at most salt with it, right? But if they have to add sodium, you know, bisphosphate and EDTA and three other ingredients, it's no longer just asparagus. It's asparagus soaked with a chemical that you'll eat. It might taste similar if you saute it up and add your seasonings, but it's not. It's now a chemicalized food. And when that comes into our body, it causes a very toxic type of reaction, okay? And our cells are designed to eat food, and then the waste products of that food get eliminated. But when the waste products are comparable amounts to the food that we're consuming, it has a hard time doing that. And then it uses tons of energy trying to get rid of the toxins, usually getting behind the eight ball to do that, and then it can't digest the food very well. So all of a sudden there's this gas and bloating and bowel issues and things that come along with that. Does that make sense? So that's a general overview of just you know, certain elements of food and eating and things like that. Now let's talk a little bit more about some of the – the myths, again, about uh, foods that we've all heard, okay? And at a point, I'm going to ask you guys questions and throw some out at me, and we'll try to walk through some of those together, okay? But let's talk about keto, because it is something that has been very much the buzz in, in our, uh, oh, I didn't go into the final part of this. So this is the carbs, 40 to 60%, protein, 30 to 40%, and fats, about 10%. Keto diet is about 70% fat plus, so 60% more than the typical American diet does. Proteins are about 20 25 percent okay so that's less than the, even the traditional amounts of proteins we would get and carbohydrates are about five percent net carbs so since 40 to 60 percent is what we've been taught to eat and learn learn how to eat for most of our lives that's a pretty significant difference okay so carbs drops off a cliff and fats jump through the roof okay so with that being said tell me how healthy is keto that okay well let me let me even backtrack earlier okay because maybe some of you have experienced this let's say because keto is similar to another type of uh, dietary habit that was used much in the 70s and 80s yes Atkins. that's the one thank you okay how healthy is or was Atkins what? wasn't so much did people lose weight on Atkins yeah. they did did it stay off them no no okay and why was that what's the difference between Atkins 
and maybe if you don't know about it yet, I'll have to answer that, but in keto nowadays. That means there's higher protein in there with that. Correct, yeah. So in the absence of um, carbohydrates and you take in proteins, what does that protein turn into? It'll turn into sugar. Okay, there's some basic physiology and understanding. The body needs to run on one of two fuel sources primarily. And the one that it's just designed to do because it's what we've been eating and mom and dad were eating and grandma and grandma and grandpa were eating is it carbs of any sort will turn into glucose and that is what the body runs on. And when balanced well by the insulin levels in the body in moderate amounts and not getting spikes and crashes all day, the body can do pretty well with that. Proteins, often they're used to build a muscles, tissues in the body, but in the absence of carbohydrates, if the body's used to burning glucose, protein turns into glucose. Does anyone know that? Okay, that's an important thing to understand because yes, you're correct, Atkins had higher protein, okay, and it was, it was originally designed on the whole ketone element, and Atkins was talking a lot about that, but it was so controversial in the day that there was a little bit of, he kind of backed off the fats part of it, and it was like, well, proteins are okay because they're not these carbs that I'm talking about, so go ahead and do that. But they created a lot of inflammation. High, high amounts of the proteins create uh, ele- um, um, inflammation as well as do carbs, okay? So, and it's because it ends up turning into glucose as well. The spike of the sugar is not the same, okay? But eventually it turns into that. But fats, I mean, eventually they can turn into glucose, but there's a lot more steps that has to go through to do that. So the body gets prepped well enough in, in condition, and it shifts from the old you know, model of, of you know, carb-heavy you know, dieting and low fat to a high fat, low carb, moderate protein diet, which is what keto is. It can actually be actually quite healthy. And studies have been done to show that even high calorie diets, if they're this is an extreme study, they did 90% fats, 90% proteins, or 90% carbohydrates were consumed by groups of people. And which of the groups you know lost the most weight? The 90% fat group. Okay, because the body was basically using it as fuel and it wasn't retaining it as body weight. Okay, the other ones had you know, byproducts that would turn into sugar and irritations and things like that, inflammation, stress in the kidneys, but the, the fats didn't have the same effect. So that's an important thing to understand. So with that being known, so we'll throw Atkins out the window because it was it was too high in the protein elements. But he was also a you know, pretty big fan of like, you know, um, pork rinds and any kind of fat that you can think of, maybe just traditionally raised bacon, okay? Because let's hit that one right, you know, right out of the gate. How, how healthy or unhealthy is bacon? Raise your hands. How, bacon is healthy, raise your hands. I think some is. Okay. The, the uh, not processed, it's the natural, we right. procured bacon. Yeah, that's a I fantastic answer. In, in fact. small, and you know, everything in moderation, but I feel that that's okay. Correct. If it's raised properly and it's processed minimally, and you're not adding tons of the other nitrates and and nitrites and stuff like that, as well as sugar. A lot of bacon actually has sugar added to it because people love sweet. So you add that into the hickory smoking process, and boom, you've got that. But if it is done well, and especially if you get an organic source from you know really organically fed, you know preferably free range type of, of, of pork, then that's the absolute best way to consume it. So in that sense, it was a great answer, okay? So Judy, you had the right answer, you had the right answer, and those that said it's bad would have also had the right answer because if you're buying the wrong version, it would be. Does that make sense? So just carte blanche saying go ahead and eat bacon and wrap everything with it you know, for the Atkins or keto version now, you can go either way with it. It's the type of the food that you're actually consuming. And bacon is actually a staple in a lot of people's world with that. But believe it or not, if you're consuming tons of bacon, by the time you cook it, most people don't leave it like – yeah, they don't like flash fry like a steak, you know, because they're, they're cooking off a fair amount of that fat, and that fat gets discarded. So what you're left with primarily is the protein part of it, okay? So it's okay to eat, but you do have to, you know, keep in check that there's a fair amount of protein to fats in that. So depending on what else you're eating with it, could throw what's called your macros out of balance. So if you eat too much of it, it was just that, this number of protein would kick up higher compared to the, uh, to the fats. And for a person trying to do a ketogenic diet, you have to get to a certain level of using fats only for your body to shift gears from glucose to burning ketones. And that's, you know, 
that's a whole other lecture. But ultimately, once you shift over and the body becomes what they call fat adapted, it will actually use ketones as a fuel source instead of glucose. Why is that good? Do we have tons of like glucose stuck to our body that it can use at the drop of a hat when we haven't eaten for a day? Anyone know? Not a ton. There's a little bit. There's something called glycogen that's stored in the body, some in the liver and some in the muscle tissue. So when you wake up in the morning, you haven't eaten in six or eight hours. Do you pass out every morning? No. Okay. Because your body has, you know, even though it hasn't eaten for a while and your glucose level should be low, your body is regulating that through, if it needs to, to release small amounts of glycogen from the liver and then also from the, the muscle tissue. At least upwards of about 24 hours in most, most people's cases, or if you're an extreme athlete, you might rip through that a lot quicker during a training uh, exercise of some sort. So when your body depletes the glucose, has anyone ever gotten sick and not eaten for like a day or two or just you tried and nothing's going down well? You ever notice a slight change in your breath? It gets a little bit not so well tasting and a little stronger than those around you. It's like acetone. That is a, a byproduct of your body shifting from glucose and trying to dip into a reserve of energy that it's got in many cases quite available in it. And what is that reserve of energy? Fats. Fats. Because we all have a certain amount of body fat. I mean, to be near death, you, you know, two to three percent, okay, of a hundred pound person is still pounds of fat. Most people are, you know, well above ten to fifteen percent, and obesity becomes well over twenty five percent of. Uh, excuse me, not twenty five percent, but almost upwards of fifty percent of a person's body weight could actually be body fat. So there could be a lot of um, weight available in the body that it can actually dip into. So when it gets sick and it burns through the glycogen reserves because no food's coming in it'll dip into fats and basically start to burn those ketones. And the byproduct initially is that acetone coming off of the breath. And if you continue to properly do that, not just starve it for a day or two, like when you're sick, then you've actually fed the body more fats and less carbs and it doesn't have these available, it shifts gears into the ketones and it can actually start to do that. So in that sense, it can actually be a wonderful thing. And since you have so much fuel available, if I'm a marathon runner, and I'm running, and after maybe two or three hours, I, I burn through all my glycogen stores. I have to be, you know, shooting in, you know, packets of glucose to keep my muscles working. Anyone ever see that? The power aids and whatever else they're doing to keep running. But if I'm really, you know, fat adapted and I'm using ketones, my body will just, it'll be dipping into the, the fat reserves as I run. Okay. Mark Sisson calls it the bun and thigh cafe. Okay, got a little bit on the buns, okay, and a little bit on the thighs, and let's just let's just keep on going. No food's coming in, so I'm just going to burn through that. So that being said, it can be a very healthy way to lose weight by getting the body into that. So you're getting a moderate amount of fat, or excuse me, calories through the diet, but maybe you're using a little bit more than you're consuming. But nutritionally, it's really nutritional dense, so you start to deplete some of the additional reserve of energy available, which is called fat. And that's how people lose fat. Does that make sense? So that being said, it sounds really grand and glorious that you know the ketogenic diet is healthy, right? I've just pitched it as being like the best thing in the world, especially if you're a marathon runner. But how you do it is what's important, okay? Because again, Atkins could have been done well. A person could have easily made Atkins a ketone type of diet, eating clean foods and stuff like that. But let's walk through like some scenarios in terms of what I might eat if I'm on a ketogenic diet, all right? So I could wake up in the morning and, uh, well, I'll talk about this one and let's, let's give it a, a plus or a minus. Eggs. How are eggs? Okay. okay. So who would rate, it, rate eggs an A? Uh, you know, how about a B? C or less? Fail? Flunk it? Another? Well, okay, what about 20 years ago? How were eggs in, in the in 1990s and 2000s? They're awful. We're going to kill everybody, right? Gonna be the next, you know, Armageddon. Okay, everyone's gonna drop dead with the first egg that they ate. So what did I eat? Egg beaters, right? The whites are good because they got protein in it, but none of the yolks. And they added about 20 other chemicals to it to make it look yellow, and I consumed that. Not a good choice. Okay. So most people said an A or a B. Are all eggs an A or a B? Now, what if I'm feeding chickens that are, you know, stuck in really tight cages? you know, just junk food and they're not allowed to get out and really breathe and they're not treated humanely. And, you know, they're kind of walking around in some of their own stuff. They're eating around the same, for lack of a term, excrement that's coming out of them. How's the, how's the health of those eggs? How's the health of those chickens? Not very good, right? 
So the egg itself isn't necessarily good or bad. It's like, again, where did it come from? Anyone ever crack an eggshell? And it's like, no, oh, that didn't work. And you have to hit it another time because you didn't give it enough oomph the first time. And then it's nice. And sometimes you break it open as a nice yellow to orange yolk inside of it. And other times you're like, as you're going down towards the bowl, it's cracking your hands, okay, because the shell's so weak and you got to pick up 20 flakes of shell in it and it's this barely yellow kind of yolk in it. That's a good indication of the health of the chicken and therefore the health and nutritional density of the yolk. So again, how it was being fed, what was fed to the chicken and passing along to the person has a lot to say about it. If they're eating junk, ultimately you're going to be eating a junk byproduct because remember, what's born is you are what you eat, okay? So that chicken will become from the egg what its parents ate and not an, a very good healthy source. Does that make sense? So, all right, so eggs can be very good and, and, and for the most part, it's one of the most complete foods. So just understand that concept. So let's say we're going to have a breakfast and it's, and it's eggs and it's a little bit of bacon with maybe still a little bit of the fat on it and some salsa good meal bad meal yeah. sounds pretty decent right sounds good. and if i throw in two or three tablespoons maybe two tablespoons of butter on top of that is it still good butter yeah okay butter's better than margarine butter's butter is better i love that, that butter. expression good always use butter good now what if the cows we're hanging out with the chickens that I talked about in that earlier model. They're, they're in the same, maybe they're in the same cage, just really small cages, okay? And these cows are getting that, and you know they're trying to, you know, milk them through this, and they're milking. The, the hands are dirty of the people cleaning it, you know, and it's going into the thing, but it's pasteurized. So all that bacteria, okay, is now, uh, uh, I don't know what I want to say, is now cleansed away. So we think about milk, right? And we, we see the byproduct of, of what comes from those cows. So Ultimately, we know that that's uh, not a good thing to have you know, bacteria in food, but if you pasteurize it, what happens? You kill it, right? So I'm kind of talking more on the milk side of it here for a second because my brain just digressed for a second. So what happens when you pasteurize milk that wasn't necessarily the healthiest cows and a pretty high amount of bacteria and the handling of it wasn't that great? What happens to all that bacteria? What's that? Could it go into the milk? It goes into the milk, exactly. Yeah. And it's now dead. So you have a lot of dead bacteria in your milk, but it's considered sanitary because it's been killed. Is it healthy for the body? No. Okay. It doesn't exactly contribute to an incredibly healthy situation there. Okay. So that's kind of, I jumped into the milk situation there because we think about milk as a you know, good or a bad you know, source. But the conditions in which it was raised was the cow. Um, and if you remember, obviously cream comes from milk. Okay, so that's why I jumped into the flat out milk. So so we skim off the cream from the top of that version of it, or we skim off the cream from one that's walking out in the field, green grasses, lots of nutrients in the grass, fresh air, healthy, not stressed animal, not producing tons of hormones that are stress inducing. Okay, it's not going into the milk product. We skim that off, and then we put those two tablespoons of butter into our into our eggs. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you think about those? Yeah. Much better, right? Yeah. So fat in it is good. So and in fact, the grass-fed ones have a nutrient called vitamin F, which is unknown by most of the public. Okay, it's not spoken of, and it's really not recognized as a true vitamin because it can't be synthetically formulated. So they don't really, you know, accept its its existence. But it's basically an essential fatty acid. We've heard of those, like omega threes. Okay, are, are healthy. And fish, uh, flaxseed uh, is is a, is a uh, essential fatty acid which converts into uh, you know, necessary ingredients in our body for building blocks, things like that. But grass fed milk and grass fed uh, you know milk products are a much healthier source. So if you put that on it, that'd be great. Margarine would be awful. Okay, but what were we told for the last fifty years, except for maybe the last decade? Margarine will kill you, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's let's put in another thing. Let's so we'll skip the butter for a moment. We'll, yeah, we don't have any butter in the house, so we're gonna have coconut oil. So we take a tablespoon of coconut oil and throw that. Maybe two tablespoons of that in our eggs. We we cook that. Good or bad? Good. Good. Bad. Good. bad. I've heard between? both. You heard both. So I don't know. Okay, great. Well, that's what we're gonna try to do is bust some of those myths yeah. about whether it's good or bad, right? 
All right, so why might it be bad? Just give me a, an option. Oh, okay. What's that? Oh, you said good? All right, that's somebody said bad. I'm sorry. All right, so 20 years ago, if asked, you know, putting coconut oil in something, like let's say they were going to make your popcorn with coconut oil or you're going to you know, cook with coconut oil, they would have, like, shamed you to death, okay? And they would have probably, you know, just called the, uh, the people to put in your obituary because it was going to kill you instantly. It was a saturated fat. So you consume it, and boy, that's going to clog those arteries faster than anything. Now what is coconut oil spoken of as? It's one of the healthiest fats like known to mankind because it's very stable at room temperature. It's stable at high temperature when it's cooked with. And when it's you know, put into the body, because it's saturated, okay, the carbon-hydrogen bonds in it, are, you know, there's a, a, a saturation of those bonds. So when it goes into the body, there's less oxidation that comes about as a result of consuming it. And what is, you know, what is known to cause cancer? Oxidants, okay? We hear antioxidants, okay? You take those to get rid of you know, these cancer-causing, you know, free radicals that exist in our body. So coconut oil actually helps in many ways to support the body and not produce as many uh, free radicals and, and irritants to the body. So it's it's much more supportive. And some doctors, I can't claim to do this, but Dr. Mercola, who's a medical doctor, his book talks about the keto diet. And he literally says like an anti-cancer fighting type of diet because coconut oil is one of the key things, avocados and all of these other you know, high fat foods. Okay. So you throw the coconut oil in now, 20 years ago, would have killed you. Now it's healthy, right? Because back in the day, somebody didn't, you know, like the egg manufacturers in this country and somebody didn't like the coconut manufacturers because it was competing with corn oil and canola oil and, you know, uh, all these other you know, types of oils that are not so healthy. Okay. Another one of which is, uh, uh, and, and I'm blanking for a moment here is um, tofu. What's soy? Soy, thank you. I'm always blank. Soy. soy oil. Healthy or not healthy? 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 Yeah. They're right. All, you know, people in Asian cultures live very long periods of time, right? Because yeah, they consume right. soy, yeah. right? There's a, lot, there's a lot of Chinese people. Yes. Yeah. The soy has so a lot of fat that it's not healthy anymore. That's great. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna keep that a secret until I hear what she says because that was perfect. What's that? Soy so bad. Yeah. But why is it bad? Ten or twenty years ago, it was. Oh, you heard it. <laughs> she actually answered it, people, right over here. It was a great answer. Okay. Soy was used in small amounts in these cultures, and it's usually fermented, okay, which caused it to have a different uh, way of being digested by the body, okay, their sauces and things like that. And now we've so mutated the soy sources because it was grown in such high amounts because they thought the protein, high protein, remember, real high protein was great. So people were growing soy because it was reasonably inexpensive. It, it, it melded well with, you know, you know, a lot of the United States, you know, uh, fields and because we were modeling after another country we said oh soy is good so we started consuming massive amounts but they wanted it to you know be more uh, weed and pesticide resistant and stuff like that so they start to mutate it and uh, modify it and genetic modification creates the soy that we have nowadays and also it's a phytoestrogen it's a plant-based estrogen like compound so when it's consumed by the body it mimics estrogen so wow. do a lot of men need extra estrogen Men? No. No? <laughs> Thrilled about that idea? No. It's not going to help a lot of what we're trying to achieve. Do women need a lot of extra estrogen? No. no. In most cases, women are very estrogen dominant, and their hormonal systems are out of bounds. Okay? There's certain times of the month okay, where estrogen dominance can kick in. And Do women, when those things have happened in your life, if your cycle's ever been off, do you feel fantastic and super emotionally stable and your, your thinking is really clear and you can conquer the world and no you, you don't feel good you don't feel good physically you don't feel good mentally sometimes emotionally there's a lot more stress in your body that's that you know often estrogen dominant situation okay they can create a whole cascade of other things so that soy oil along with the co you know, uh, corn oil which aligns with high fructose corn syrup we now hear about that right so if high fructose corn syrup is bad and the oil from it is corn oil, it's, it's likely to not be the healthiest thing in the world either, okay? So that's just a whole other story. We all know the high fructose corn syrup is bad, right? We don't need to talk about that one at all. All right, great. Um, but ultimately, those types of oils, you know, were heralded for years, and they were competing with people that were manufacturing coconut oil and even butter and stuff, and there was enough pseudo evidence to say, hey, saturated fat's bad, so it got demonized, including the eggs and stuff like that. So now it's back in vogue. Unfortunately, science does always get a little bit smarter, but it's not as smart now as it will be in another 20 years, right? 
So we have to use logic and common sense with things, not just what the, the, the information today says. So with that being the case, okay, so you can eat a breakfast that's keto friendly, that's good, and you can eat a, a breakfast that's keto friendly, bad. Okay, and if you're kind of misapplying it or doing it uh, sometimes for too long for your body, that's also not a great situation. Because keto, in most people's cases that are seeing it being used by people, you kind of phase in and out of it. You might use it for three to six months, maybe longer if your body's processing well. But if it starts to feel stressed from anything you're doing, your body will start to produce cortisol. The effects of cortisol are not good. Those are the things that make us feel like we're getting older, okay? It makes us feel like we're getting gray in our, in our beards, man, or you know, when you start to see, you know, the, the, the salt starting to kick out a little bit more than, you know, than the, the hair color that you're dealing with, okay? And uh, injuries start to happen. Soft tissue injuries, elbow sprain strains, wrists. Okay, you cut yourself, it takes longer to bleed. Maybe you're not sleeping as well at night. Uh, your, your mental clarity is not as good. That's often a byproduct of a lot of things, but cortisol is definitely one of those, and that's, um, that's the response of stress. So if keto is good, and you're using it, and using it, and the body likes it, and everything's working well, but then all of a sudden, for some reason, the body doesn't want as much of that, because remember, it's maybe had a, a lifetime of this, and it's shifting gears to this, and it's working for a phase of time. If it starts to shift gears, and it's like, I kind of missed some of that, because this isn't all bad. Okay, and my, you know, this is what many people, probably 99% of the world has lived on for much of, of, of eternity, okay? But there's seasons, okay? Uh, even times of uh, many, many years ago, you hear feast or famine, right? So cultures, especially those that would go out and like hunt, Indians, for instance, okay, in the middle of the winter, did they have a, a ton of like buffalo, you know, out on the field, you know, you know, grazing and stuff that they could hunt? No. Okay, they didn't get enough of them, you know, during the winter. Sometimes they'd starve before they get to the end of it. So they'd be in some lean times, again, like the, the bear during the winter. And then in the spring, okay, there'd be berries starting to grow and there'd be, you know, green starting to, to grow and the animals would be you know, plenty and they could go out for days and not freeze to death, hunt, and then come back with a harvest. So they would kind of go into these ketone moments where they were without foods and they were having to deplete their body reserves and dipping into the body fat like I spoke of doing that, but then they'd go out and then they'd have all these different things, including the berries and the fruits and, and the, the nuts and all these you know, meats and stuff that plenty, and the body would kick into and out of if they were ever in a ketogenic state, in and out of it. So that's why I think the body needs to vary. Does that make sense? So it can be a very healthy diet, but I think you have to really listen to the body to know how long that should be done for. Okay? So that's just you know on the side with that because other people have you know, you know said oh it affects the, the hormone system you know and women with thyroid issues shouldn't do it I think it's because they've misappropriated how it's done okay some of the, the cleanliness of the types of fats and things that they're consuming and how long they do it for you have to listen to the body but you might have to cycle in and out of it and I'll leave that point for a bit all right gluten who likes gluten likes it or who does it like? <laughs> Great question. All right. Is gluten free better or worse than gluten not free? Should people should all people be gluten free or should they not? Isn't the gluten thing on how it's been processed? It has a lot to do with it too. So if we've had a lifetime, again kind of like the glucose, a lifetime of eating gluten that's been not, you know, grown well, okay, genetically modified, processed to death. <clears throat> and then we consume it in our bodies, our bodies aren't going to do well with that over a lifetime of improper digestion of that. So it can start to develop allergies and gluten intolerances and gluten you know, sensitivity start to occur. Now, once upon a time when you would grow wheat in the fields, okay, I mean, let's, let's kind of link gluten and wheat for a minute here, okay? Mm -hmm. Wheat growing out, because that's one of the most commonly consumed forms of it. So wheat's growing out in the fields, okay? If you were a farmer, you, you'd use some kind of a, a tool or, uh, or something being pulled by um, you know, horses or oxen or something like that to till and, and work with the field. But you didn't have big machines that could just go in and do what you were doing. So a lot of stuff was done. You'd like chop down the wheat. You might sit out there for a little bit as it was drying in the fields. Or in, in many cases, over two or three, four days with the rain hitting it and drying it in the sun, it would crack open. It's called like a cracked wheat. And anyone ever hear that term? Mm -hmm. what, what is that cracking actually? Does anyone understand what that process is? Germination. 
Yeah, in, in a sense, yeah. It it's, comes out of there. Yeah, it's like, it's like breaking through like the, the nutrient shells, that you know, like the, the wheat berries by that happening. So when that occurs, and then they would go home and grind it in like a mortar and pestle or some kind of a way of grinding process, and then bake bread with it, the nutrients were just starting to crack open, and they'd grind it, and then it would be available in that baking process, and you'd have a, a whole food. And it would have you know, all of the components of it. The, the wheat, you know, germ and the bran and, 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 and the starchy part, which we're used to. What do we eat? We eat flour, which is the starchy part of the wheat. They basically strip it from the, the bran and the germ, which is the good parts of wheat, and they say, here's your flour. And you bake your breads and you, break, you make your cereals and you make your uh, breakfast foods and the bagels and stuff like that. And you eat that over a lifetime. And that's not the way that it was made originally. It was the whole thing. But when they actually did it, because it was cracking open those nutrients, it not only had that, plus it had live nutrients and good fats in that uh, soil. And they would actually have fertilization of these soils because animals would go out there and there would be natural fertilization and things that happen. Now we, we plant it, we, we put it on a base of soil that's about that thick. We plant it, it starts to grow, and then they come in there and if they need to for you know pesticide purposes, they'll spray that. And if they need to put it in fertilizers, they'll spray a thin layer of fertilizer on top of it usually just chemicals or minerals and stuff like that. And then after it grows, they'll come in with a machine, and as it's there, they'll just hack it down, and within hours, it's at a plant being broken down and you know, turned into flour. And they're not giving you the whole grain in most cases. They're giving you the stripped-down parts of it. They're just taking all the B vitamins out of it, many other nutrients, but you have to have B vitamins in it when it's sent to, you know, sent to, uh, to the stores because you can't be without certain nutrients because the FDA realized that people were getting deficient in these vitamins that were stripped out of it. So what do they do? They spray in synthetic B vitamins and other nutrients back into it, put it on the shelf. They're much more stable than the B vitamins that were in it that were alive and real. And there you go. Your flour can sit on the shelf for weeks and months and probably years, and you can consume it. And then you go and make it into something, or someone makes that for you, you eat it, and that is not the form for which it was originally made. So your body starts to develop an allergy. An allergy is basically just some kind of protein gets into your body, into the bloodstream at some point, whether it's a bee sting or an undigested food like gluten, which is a protein, and eventually it gets into the bloodstream, starts to create an irritation, and the body starts to attack it, and then eventually it does that long enough, it starts to attack itself, called an autoimmune condition, and people start to get all sorts of secondary conditions from it. Make sense? So that's where allergies come from. So when you develop an allergy at 40, it's in most cases not a true allergy. It's basically just an autoimmune reaction that's been going on for decades, trying to digest and work with this thing properly, and they can't handle it. So there you go. So when a person develops a bunch between 30 to 60 years of age, there's, there's digestive issues that have to typically be worked through to improve that circumstance. Okay? So that's, you know, that's the situation. So gluten, good or bad? Depends on the gluten. Depends on the gluten, again. So if the, let's say the source of it's good, and now someone's gluten sensitive, and we give them that source, they're probably not going to digest it very well. The person's a diabetic, and I give them the most pure form of natural sugar on the planet, okay, raised on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro and, you know, natural rains and all this other stuff, and I give them that cane sugar that's growing there, and they, I feed it to them, the blood sugar is going to spike because they've destroyed their body's ability to handle that thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, could it be rehab in some cases? Probably, yeah, depending on the severity of it. But that's the same situation with gluten. So at a point, some people have to be gluten-free. So when I now go to the store and I have a whole gluten-free section, is it all the same? No. Okay. There are a lot of candies, one of which I just you know, was looking up some just you know, to have off the top of my head earlier. Okay. Uh, like Skittles. Okay. And uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. And most types of chocolate, I think Twizzlers are, if I'm not mistaken. You know, a lot of the very sweet and, you know, Cap'n Crunch type cereals are gluten-free. Many, many pastries and cupcakes and things like that are gluten-free, but they've got all that same frosting and stuff on top of it. Are they healthy? No. But do they have the gluten-free label? Yes, they do. So that's why you have to be careful of seeing gluten-free and say, oh, my doctor said I shouldn't eat gluten, therefore I should eat a gluten-free thing. Well, there's probably about 95,000 things in a grocery store that are gluten-free, including the bleach and all these other things, okay, that probably wouldn't want to recommend consuming. Kind of like saying something's all natural. Well, yes, so is lead, and so is arsenic, and so is all these other things, okay? Just be careful with the wording that's used to kind of herald something as healthy. 
All right, that's an important thing to understand. So I'm all in favor of In fact, I'm very sensitive to wheat. I was told at the age, about age 12, 13. So I gave up red meat for 20 years, but I wasn't going to give up my bagel, okay, which somebody told me I was sensitive to. I did some muscle testing and stuff by a chiropractor 30-something years ago. He said, you're sensitive to wheat. I wouldn't eat it. I'm like, okay, well, so I had a bagel the next morning and barely any, uh, you know, fats on it. So I was just so carb-driven, and that's all I ever ate. And I always had dark circles under my eyes, and I just thought it was that European you know, blood that I had. And they just so many of them had that, but usually it was because a lot of them happened to be smokers and other things like that. And mine was because of my wheat. I also have been allergic to cats most of my life, and I realized many years later when I didn't eat wheat for over a year uh, of any sorts, I went around a, a place you know that had a bunch of cats in it. I was in there for like an hour, and then I finally was going to get up to leave. And I see some cats walking by. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you had cats, and didn't react. And then I kept try, trying this. If I ate wheat and I went around cats, I'd react. If I didn't eat wheat and I went around cats, okay, didn't. So what was it? Was I allergic to cats or not? No, I was allergic and or sensitive, whichever way you want to call it, to the wheat. My immune system was weakened. This other thing comes in, which was a little irritating, but not enough to set me off unless I was already knocked down a few bags. Oh. Make sense? Yeah. So many people have similar things like that. Like they, I'd love to be able to eat some onions or, uh, or or spicy foods, maybe a little cayenne and stuff, because I like that, but oh, it just tears my stomach up. So it's the onion's fault. It's the cayenne's fault. It's the, Could it be? Is it, is it the tomato sauce? Maybe. Was it always that way? No, it's, it's ever been in the last 10, 20 years. You developed it. Something else caused you to develop that, and it was likely a food. And it was likely... The word that was yelled out by Dr. Ben and you said earlier, sugar, okay? Because those are so prevalent in so many things. And even allergies like we were talking about, eggs, many people are allergic to, dairy, many people are allergic to, peanuts, many people are allergic to, um, what else? Give me some other foods that people tend to be, uh, oh, soy, actually, that's that's a pseudo oh, food, so that doesn't really count. What's that? Tree nuts. Tree nuts so and things like that, especially, yeah, like even though peanuts aren't really a nut, Okay, people are sensitive to it. But in many cases, they're sensitive to those gluten. That was the other one I was trying to think of. Because it's not often even just the gluten you're consuming, but when people have wheat, what do they often have with it? Sugar. Sure. Sure. Okay? If I have a bagel, I don't just eat a bagel. I mean, it turns into sugar. Okay? I eat it with my coffee and sugar. Okay? My, uh, my juice. Six to eight ounces of orange juice, believe it or not. Healthy or not? Uh, or let's say, let's just, I'll use this litmus test. Six to eight, let's eight ounces of organically grown orange juice. Healthy. Okay. Is it sweet? No sweet. It doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. It does. So here's a way to assess whether that's a lot of sugar or not. If I'm a diabetic, I pass out on the floor. Low blood sugar. What do you do to revive me? Okay. Does it take a lot? It takes like a sip or two. Woo, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Have a whole glass of it. I'm ready for the whole day until about an hour later then I pass out again. Okay. Because it went high and then it crashes again. So that's what you have to be cautious with. Now, if I eat an orange, same thing. I'd have that. I can suck on you know, the juice of an orange and probably revive me as well. How many oranges go into a glass of orange juice? Anyone ever go to one of those places that press it and you're really excited to get really fresh squeezed Florida orange juice, all right? So I've done this, I'm like, oh, I can't wait. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'll, I'll, get uh, I'll get, I'll get a large, okay? The large is usually about eight ounces, okay? Because it takes about four oranges to just make that thing. And by the time they sell it to you, I mean, it costs them so much to make a 16 or 20 ounce, which is a typical large we're used to. It's like literally like eight ounces. And they're pressing like four oranges to get you that. Whoever eats full four, Four full-size oranges in one sitting. Yeah. Not too often. Why? Because all the pulp and all, all the inconvenience of having to un undo the peel and stuff like that, it just gets to be too much. But literally, you couldn't stomach that much because of all the fiber. But what do we do so we can even have more of it nowadays when we make orange juice? We skim the pulp out of it because that just slows down the process, right? I can't drink as much. So now you're getting 100% pure sugar with a little bit of vitamin C thrown in. And maybe now they'll throw in vitamin D because vitamin D is healthy, right? Make sense? So again, okay, 
Well, could orange juice be healthy? Absolutely. If you had like a, a couple ounces or something, or maybe mm -hmm. once in a while, like once a year or something, a special celebration. <laughs> once a year. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay, but we had it. Every, I, I had it every day because it was healthy, low fat, gluten free. It's got to be good, right? And it was killing me. All right, so those are things that people have to be aware of. Is it can sound good, but and just because it's natural, I I totally bought into the whole idea. Let's just ask this question before I go any further. Fruit. Generic wrapping fruit, healthy or not? There's a lot of sugar in it, but it's natural sugar. Natural sugar is right. So we have um, the, the the bottom of the, the food pyramid. Six. To, I can't remember which one's which, and it doesn't quite honestly matter. But it's like six to twelve servings of fruits and vegetables every day. I wish they at least said vegetables and fruits. Okay, at least in that order. Okay, but fruits and vegetables. So if I was to have three or four pieces of fruit a day, and then a whole bunch of vegetables, is that a good choice? Okay, I got a yeah. It's going to depend, I think, of how much you're eating. There's the truth in that, yeah. So let's say I have an apple, I have an orange, I have a banana, and I have a handful of grapes. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's a lot, though. Sure. That, that's, I mean, I couldn't even eat all that. Okay, spread it over a day. It's not terribly <laughs> uncommon, okay? Because you can throw one in and in with lunch or breakfast. You got your banana sliced with whatever. Yeah. Four hours later, you're eating, and then you have a salad, and maybe you, you know, a small salad, and you have some grapes with that, and then your dinner. And you know, I'm being healthy, so I'm not eating dessert. So you just have you slice up a pineapple. It's easy to knock off about half a pineapple. If you ever cut a fresh one, yeah, start dipping into that, and after 12 pieces, you mm -hmm. think you're done. You put it away, and then you take it out 10 seconds later because that last bite tasted really good. I've done that. I went to Hawaii, came back, and was eating like half a pineapple a day for a while. It was like insane because <laughs> <clears throat> nothing's better than that. A lot of sugar, okay? Is it fruit sugar? Absolutely, okay? But um, kind of like high fructose corn syrup they talk about being bad. It's a lot of fructose in fruit. So in, in many ways, fruit sugar can actually be harsher on the body than even some just straight-up glucose. And we'll get into all the science. Jonathan can explain all the science between there's – uh, sucro sucrose and glucose and fructose and how well different ones are absorbed but fructose actually can have a higher spike on the, on the, on the body's blood sugar effect you know, even more than other sugars can so large amounts of it would be a, a factor but anyone that's maybe older than a couple a couple of people in the room here remember back 30 years ago okay you get an apple off of a tree mm -hmm. did it take like two hands to, to hold the thing okay to get it off the tree no it's like barely fit in like two fingers it's like a little Crab apple or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not very big. Now, granted, there's different versions and strains, of it, but none of them were that big. Even in the store, you'd buy these little apples. Mm -hmm. A ton of them would fit in one bag. Are they the same size apples that we're buying nowadays? No. No. It was almost like a large grape we used to eat. And now it's like the size of a watermelon. Okay? So it's, it's still an apple, but a lot more sugars in one package, okay? And that's the same type of thing. And a lot sweeter because those have been, in many cases, modified to make them more Taste, you know, tasty. You know, a tart apple like a you know, Granny Smith, not quite as sweet, therefore a little less sugar in it, versus one that's like just dripping and oozing with that sweetness, and we consume that. So we may gravitate more towards one and bake with the other because we have to then add two cups of sugar on top of that one to make it palatable, right? So if you're going to have an apple, go with a Granny Smith. Don't pick the biggest one in the bunch every single time. And if you're going to have half of one, yes, it might go a little brown, put a little lemon juice on it, put it in some Tupperware, and it'll last till the next day. Not a big deal. So it's quantity of those things. But I'd say one to maybe two servings of fruit per day at the most, mm -hmm. and preferably the lower glycemic ones like berries, strawberries, raspberry, blueberry, uh, the, 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 the tart type of apples and things like that. But the sweeter ones that they make juices into, and, and apples obviously they do that somewhat as well, but those are the best choices because they're very glycemic and that affects the body as well. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so... Uh, Anyone you know, keen on the gluten thing there? You got that one pretty well under control there. Gluten can be okay, so I don't want to hit that one anymore. So I want to open it up to a few. Uh, after I may have one more real quick. Yogurt. Good, bad? Good. Good. Depends okay. on the yogurt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you so you guys disagree over there. Did you come here together? I don't know. Is the yogurt okay yeah. in the house over there? Yeah. I, I'm just I, do, I do agree, but it's, it's uh, again, you got to get the, the pure yogurt. Yes. That's a, I'm a label reader. Right. So if it's got more than a few, it gets, I don't even get past the third or fourth ingredient. I don't like anything. Great. And I put it back. Well, you said that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, why'd you say that? That's my start of reading wow. labels. Yep. 
I had a friend who might have used to work at the yogurt place. And <laughs> used to give yogurt to his friends, and their homes looked like they came like 10 or 12. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> they were yeah. losing the weight. Gotcha. Great question. Great question. All right, great point. Yeah. So if you consume yogurt, that's the same thing. Healthy, Healthy cows. Yogurt. Okay. Preferably, you know, not super, super pasteurized. Believe it or not, there are some yogurts that are pasteurized, but they're very low heat temperature yogurts that are great options. Okay, and you can kind of look into that. Maple Hill um, Dairy is one of those. Okay, it's as low heat temperature as you can, so it saves a lot of those enzymes in it, and you consume that. So in the store, there's always two types of yogurts that sit right next to each other. Let's say you're going to get the big container. You get the plain yogurt, and then you get the vanilla yogurt. They're the same color. Whole milk plain. Whole milk plain. Okay, how is that different from whole milk vanilla? I mean, vanilla's not bad for you, right? I've had the vanilla before, and I don't want, you know, I've okay. it. I'll say right. vanilla better. I, I like the vanilla better like, too. <laughs> Why is that? I like the plain one better. I'm not sure. Correct. Vanilla is the same color, minus maybe a little bit of, you know, yeah. color change, but they throw sugar in it. That's why you can have it by itself. Okay? If you, I like to pick on people with this. I'll, I'd ask sometimes at a lecture, who eats ice cream for breakfast? And nobody really raises their hands. Oh, he does. Okay. So this guy over here, can I turn that the camera towards him? Okay, ice cream for breakfast doesn't go over super well in terms of the health arena. Just for your uh, <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> Actually, I, I, won't, I won't go to that story, but I, I, like I can know. understand that. I've, I've been there before. All right, so eating... Uh, Eating ice cream is not a great idea. We all know that to be the case. But how different is it from many of the traditional yogurts, okay? It's it's milk, milk cream, it's sugar, and it's fruit. And then you throw bacteria in it, and now you've got yogurt. You take the bacteria out of it, and you've got ice cream. How different are they, okay? So it's the sweetening factor that's a big difference there. So we would never consider the, the ice cream probably in most cases unless you hang out with him a lot. But we, we would if... Uh, <laughs> If somebody tells us enough times that yogurt's the best thing on the planet, and it actually can be very good, but preferably the ones that don't add the sugar. Add your own berries. If you need a little extra sweet in between those bites with the berry in it, put some stevia in if you're if you're in line with stevia. Stevia is a decent option. No blood sugar spike from that. Okay, good option there. Great. Uh, last one, maybe granola. Good or bad? Bad. Yeah, he's just going based off of my prior. <laughs> It depends. I'd rather have oatmeal. Depends. Oatmeal. Do you know There's how it's Because I would say yes, but then it, only if you made it yourself. But then any granola I've like ever seen anywhere, which I could be missing things, has not been good. If you flip it over, in most it's cases, you'll yeah. see sometimes not super, it's not funny. super high sugar it's sometimes. Good. But often very high carbs, okay? And remember, carbs do turn into glucose, like we talked about, so that can have that factor. They're starting to come out now. The first one I saw was Steve's Paleo Crunch uh, uh, granola, where it's all nuts and seeds, has a little bit of honey to sweeten it, and there's only five, you know, five grams of sugars in a that serving of it. Good. Okay, versus a lot of, and not many other carbs, a lot of fiber, okay, because it's all nuts and seeds. Most traditional is like a lot of, uh, grains and things like that that basically elevate the amount of it. So there's even like granola type cereals, which are often very high in carbohydrates. So just be cautious in consuming that. So, um, well, let me open it up to you guys now. There's a few others I wanted to kind of hit, you know, what I was thinking about, but talk about some other foods that, you know, maybe you're not so sure about healthy or not. Anyone think of any? Cheese. Cheese, okay. Great. What's the best type of cheese to consume? Swiss. 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 Okay. <laughs> well, maybe a little more generic than that. Okay. Raw. Is it raw? Or grass fed. Yeah, raw and raw grass fed would be the absolute best. Why? Because it's it hasn't been superheated, it still has the enzymes in it, and when we consume it, because there is proteins in that cheese, then we will digest it easier. So people that are lactose intolerant or they're sensitive to casein, which is the proteins in milk and they're allergic to it. If the enzymes are still in the food that you're consuming, it'll help to digest itself. An apple that's you know falls from a tree will eventually rot. Okay, you know if you um, were to pasteurize that apple, okay, or maybe applesauce, it can sit there for a long time before it starts to really go bad. Okay, it's similar to that of milk. So once you superheat it and kill it off, and all the bacteria stuff I talked about before, and consume that, it's not nearly as good. Okay, so you know the standards for Raw products, because they still have to test for bacteria, are far, far, far superior 
to that of a traditionally raised dog. Because remember, you can have a lot of bacteria in the milk, pasteurize it so there's none active and live that are detectable, but it's still in that. And those dead bacteria still create an immune reaction of people when they consume it. So if you can get like stuff or small batch stuff, local farms often make these things and uh, you know you can only sell a certain amount of uh, raw things. You have a lot of licensure and, and certification in the United and uh, New York especially. But if you can buy that, it's fantastic. The Green Earth has raw, you know, cheddar cheese that we use. It's one of our favorites. Uh, there's a little bit in Hannaford. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to find and a little bit pricey, but definitely well worth it. So in most cases, that'd be a good option. But if it's just traditional raised stuff, you know, I, I my preference is organic grass-fed raw. And then it's organic grass fed, then it's organic only, and then it falls off pretty quickly after that. So, yes, ma'am. What about cheese from other countries? Yeah, actually, that's a great Finland. question because a lot of their uh, their standards of growing and stuff like that are very different. It's hard to know for sure. Like Kerrygold butter, for instance, it's not a cheese, but they do have Kerrygold cheese. They're coming from grass fed cows for the most part. So, 93 plus percent of all of its food comes from grass fed sources. So if they had a cheese like that, you know, from like Ireland, it's going to be a much better option. Just like much of the, like you mentioned about the uh, the wheat, depends on where it's from, I think you said something like that. Well, there's a lot of people that are sensitive to wheat in our country, but they get stuff from Europe and some of those smaller countries over there, and they can handle it. Mm -hmm. So it's really not the gluten, it's the way it was raised. Wow. How about uh, protein bars? What's What's that? They're glorified, candy. They're glorified candy bars. Yeah, I like how she thinks. I've, I've tried almost every protein bar on the planet, and I bought the Cliff Bar a lot of years ago because I wanted to be that guy that could hang from one arm from the rock. <laughs> and the Cliff Bar, okay, it's a great feeling, right? But if you look, flip it over, many of them have tons of soy, first of all, so that's not going to help your grip, you know, by consuming that because the, the ability to build and generate muscle, and that especially, is not very good when you have a large amount of it. But the amount of sugar is usually it's the second or third ingredient. Some source of sugar is in there, so you got to be very careful. Uh, my preference, because we, it's really like a fun thing I do with my girls, is we go into the protein bar section because I like to grab and go something. And my criteria is it's got to be under five grams of, of sugars, preferably not having any direct sugar like cane sugar and you know extracted cane sugar and you know just traditional sugar in it. It would be sweetened with like a date or honey or something like that, but not so much where it's just a date bar that's got like 25 grams of sugars in it, okay? And if it's got chocolate in it, you actually chocolate, you know, can be okay. If it's, it's the way the chocolate's sweetened, that's really an issue. So people can eat chocolate, you go ahead and try 100% pure chocolate, it's very bitter. It's gotta be sweetened with something. And if it's an okay source of that in moderate quantities, really high, like 85 plus percent dark chocolate, then you might be, you know, in an okay arena to consume that. But the stuff we're consuming is much lower than that. So yes, they are glorified chocolate bars in most cases. But there are a couple good ones out. Omega is decent. Um, kind Bar has a, a very nut-based one where it's like four grams or less of sugars. Uh, Bulletproof, uh, the Bulletproof coffee maker, they started making some protein bars, trying to actually get some distribution ability of that because those are actually pretty good. They're like less than uh, less than one to five grams, I think. So anyway, so you can play around with those and see some good options. Any other foods? Fish. Come on, I want to bust any. Oh, great. Fish or seafood, because that seems, I'm not sure lots of times great. what is, because it bounces, like one is good. There were years where actually <laughs> it was recommended that pregnant women shouldn't consume seafood because of the high quantities of mercury that was found right, and how many toxins issue. and stuff yeah. that were in that. So where it's being you know, found is, is a very big thing. There's a lot of caution with that because you can have things that are Atlantic type salmon, okay? But it's, and it's, it could even be, believe it or not, wild caught. But they're, they're a little trick, you know, there's some trickery in how they do things. They can be farm raised, released, and right outside of the cases where they're releasing it, you can far, you can wild catch things, okay? And pull caught, and there's different terminology that's used. So it's important to try to find out, you know, often through the company or northern Atlantic would tend to be the better options of things because they're really in those cold, more protected waters, less pollutions and things like that have gotten to them. If you're buying like things like tuna fish, be careful because obviously we had the, the nuclear reactor situation over there years ago and a lot of those things are being 
you know, canned and, and, uh, and uh, that to my head. made over there. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's one thing. So you have to be cautious. So things are kind of caught more, if you're going to get that, and it's in a different region of the right. world, like Norway or something, then that would be a better option. So there are definitely good options with that. Bottom feeder uh, stuff is not as good because that's where the, you know, things are going to tend to fall a lot is to the lower surfaces. So tons of clams and tons of like those bottom feeder, you know, mussels and stuff might be an issue because they're going to be, you know, laden with a lot of that stuff. So, but everything's in moderation. So, if you're, you know, doing most things like 80 to 90% well and you have those and, you know, you're not living on them all the time, probably okay, unless you're extremely sensitive, you know, to those types of irritants or you're doing some kind of cleansing process for some health condition. I would, you know, it's okay to have occasionally, but I'd avoid it if you're really, really sensitive or, or ill health. So, any others? Did I bust every food myth that there is out there? One last one. How about coffee? Oh, I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want a poll here. Raise them up if coffee is okay. In moderation. <laughs> raise them, raise them up. Put those down. Raise them up if coffee is bad. All right, cool. And I have to admit, I, I, I blasted coffee for a long time, um, and I'm still very cautious with it because you know most of the, the traditional coffee people are consuming is not the best form, and they're consuming large amounts of it. And it's very acidic to the body. And the quantities are consuming a lot of the caffeine is stripping nutrients out of the body. And uh, it can be a problem. But they're also sweetening it. So if you consume coffee, I recommend, because it is a very highly sprayed type of, it's a bean, okay? It's very highly sprayed when it's being uh, grown. Buy your own, okay? Or buy it when it can be preferably organic and things like that. Now, there are some places that, you know, they may not call them organic, but they have, they do go through a little bit more, you know, uh, caution and when they're buying their beans and stuff like that. But it's not necessarily certified organic, and they could be okay. And some stores, you know, can have those options. But if you're going to have it, try to buy it um, yourself, organic, and and process it at home and make it. And then when you sweeten it, that's the biggest thing. What you're sweetening it with, preferably don't sweeten it. And the bulletproof coffee thing, which we talked about keto earlier. Who's heard of the bulletproof coffee approach? So only a couple of people. Bulletproof coffee, and you know, high-level executive wanted to find out ways to improve cognitive function and, and energy and all sorts of you know uh, markers of good health. So he searched around and found out certain beans grown at high altitudes, okay, and consumed with good quantities of fats, okay, would absolutely absorb into the body well often kick a person into the ketogenic type of situation the way it was utilized, and it was really a healthy situation in moderate amounts. So that's kind of a way to do it. So if you have coffee, try to have it with, if you're gonna have it with cream, okay? What do you prefer, half and half or cream? Cream. Half and half. Half and half? Yeah, milk. Okay, if you're gonna have it preferred from the, just the fat standpoint, no glucose in a spike, if you just have the, the cream, there's really no sugars in that. You have a half and half. It's half milk, which is, has the lactose in it, and half the other. One will taste sweeter, of course, but it, it won't you know, elevate blood sugar Okay, by doing it that way. Obviously, if you're going to add things, that's going to be another situation. Uh, how about butter in your coffee? Never tried. Okay. What is butter made out of? Cream. Cream. It's made out of cream. Interesting. Okay. So why are they different? Really not in some cases, okay? But it's the way that it's raised. So if you get that kind of grass-fed butter, like the Kerrygold we talked about earlier, and you put that in coffee, it might have a little bit more of the yellow, which ironically is part of the more natural color to cream, okay? And it's not salted because salty coffee is nasty, all right? And that would be a good option, okay? So try that. And that essential fatty acids that are in that would be good. And what the other part, component of Bulletproof Coffee is, they'll use either ghee, which is like a, Clarified butter has a lot more of the, the nutrients in it put into the coffee. They'll also put in uh, coconut oil or MCT oil, which is an extract from coconut oil. You put those two in and you blend it into a frothy kind of mix. In most cases, I don't even like the taste of coffee, but I can actually tolerate that, and it actually tastes pretty decent. But give me regular coffee with cream, and it's kind of nasty. There's something about the blending of those together that the fat – fats actually taste good. Did you realize that? Yes. Okay, when you trim all the fats out of a burger that's mm. – 80% fat, okay, and it's still got some of that fat in it, and you eat it, it kind of has a little bit more flavor. The 99% fat-free burger, it's like a hockey puck. 
<laughs> your mind's like this should be healthy, but it's really not. Okay, it just doesn't taste Heart the same. Right? So fat actually has a lot of flavor. So when you add fats to the coffee, you can get a different palate for the fats part of it versus the sweet part that we're used to. And if you need to trick yourself, go from sugar to like a honey to maybe stevia to possibly nothing. See, there's that herbal sweetener I talked about before. It doesn't affect blood sugar. But it's changing when your body's used to. When you consume a bunch of refined sugars, it's going to want a bunch of refined sugars or at least other sweet. Does that make sense? I tried the butter. That sounds interesting. I tried my black. Okay, that's cool too. I mean, I like the fat because it buffers the caffeine from just being this hard surge to your body. It kind of slows that digestibility to it. Plus, if you have a, a coffee with two to three tablespoons total, you can work your way up to two to three tablespoons of that fat in it. That will last sometimes for hours in terms of caloric. So the person that says, I only have coffee in the morning, I'm rushing out the door and I have time. Well, that's that, but no no calories, no real good calories. So your blood sugar is dipping and eventually it spikes. And by noon, lunch, you're like, oh, I'm famished. Okay, and you need to eat a bunch, including some quick glucose because you're low blood sugar. So what do you want? You want sugar. But if you have fats with the coffee, then it holds with you for a while. So by the time noon rolls around, you're not starving and you can actually tolerate it. And that's what actually people do in the ketogenic diet is they'll do intermittent fasting, which doesn't involve uh, eating breakfast. And you can do that in a healthy way. Hold on the lecture. We'll talk about that in the future. Okay? Somebody cool. had a question? Very cool. Um, honey. Honey. So I know that like it's not good if you buy it from the store. It's like really pasteurized. It's yes. from other countries with all these bad things. But like the local honey, like raw honey, or yeah. like, is that like – a good use of a sweetener or is it just really sugar? it's probably about as good of a sweetener as you can get um, because it's it's so natural um, kind of like maple syrup it's, it's just very natural it doesn't have to say organic it's coming from a maple tree in the hills and nobody touches okay but at the same token if a body has become very uh, um, intolerant to sugars because it's had so many of them and it's getting these quick spikes of blood sugar and crashes you can overdo it with the honey but I would definitely far prefer sweetening something with honey than I would with any other type of sweetener I think it's one of the best for sure, but I just wouldn't go crazy about it. So if a person's trying to de decrease and, and get away from sugars, definitely use that as an option. And small amounts, fine, if your body's not sensitive. But if a person's diabetic and you gave them honey, it will bring them out of it, just not as fast as a refined sugar would. So that's kind of indicating it's not going to spike quite as quickly. It's okay. my litmus oh, test as to how it's going to work. If you know when it's a diabetic, ask them, what do you take? You try honey? Yeah, it works, but I just don't bounce back as quick. It's an indication it's not spiking your sugar as much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to bust all sorts of more food myths, but I was joking about the three and a half hours thing. I don't know who's still tuned in, if anyone's tuned in or live or whatever, but I thank you for you know, for taking the time to be here tonight. You know, Much of what we do is to try to educate people. We feel that's the first step in trying to improve the quality of your health because an educated person is likely to become a, a wiser person, but only by applying that information. So if anything makes sense here tonight, Great, it's on your paper, you've been writing things down. That's super helpful. Inside your packets, as I see people kind of fumbling with some of their things, there is a sugar quiz, okay, which asks you some questions about that. I encourage you to take that, okay? And if it, you see there's a lot of check marks next to an affinity, a strong affinity for any types of sugar, whether it's the fruit types or whatever, your body's probably running towards strong push for glucose. If you get dips in the day where your energy's crashing, Obviously, it is likely to be affecting your health, but prediabetes is rampant, and a lot of other health conditions are very much irritated by consuming of sugars. So it's absolutely the most take-home message I can give. So when you read labels like we were talking about, flip it over. Don't just look at the fats, proteins, you know, carbs list, but actually look at the ingredients list. And if it's got more than a few things, it's more processed. Okay. Now there are some things that maybe have 20 ingredients, but they're all still foods. That's okay. It's called seasonings and things like that. But if it's got artificial things. Just stay away from it. So it's using that common sense approach, okay? And please don't take anything that I'm saying as like the gospel truth for you. Everybody's different. So, you know, a keto type of thing may not be right for you at all. Gluten-free, you know, even if it's the good versions of gluten-free may not either because there's a lot of nutrients in, you know, gluten, believe it or not, containing foods like wheat if it's done properly, okay? But a big part of what we do with our lecturing, and I'll just, you know, take a, a second to explain this. Uh, who here is a nutrition response testing Patient. Okay, so a fair amount of yeah. you are. Okay, fantastic. Okay, that's great. And that's so much of what we like to do is people that are already under program because it's hard when we're working with you and trying to talk about the specifics and what types of foods you should eat and whatnot to go into a lot more detail like this. So I encourage you if you've liked what you heard here tonight 
please come to other lectures because they're all, all a little bit different. I'm usually the same one doing it, but I try to get a little bit different. I'm pretty funny most times, but I was on, <laughs> online here, so I was trying to be more reserved. Just, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyway, I encourage you, uh, come. But also, if you have friends or family that are struggling with things, many people say, yeah, I referred my you know, brother to come to see you guys, and uh, he's just not a believer. Oh, the whole chiropractic thing, they'll kill you. And you know, eating healthy, that's just not, that doesn't make sense, okay? So none of that, you know, by, you know, makes sense to go to see a doctor that you don't totally buy into. But people will often at least appease you by coming to a lecture, okay? I'm just going to go and hear a little bit about cardiovascular stuff. Okay, cool. Bring them along. They might hear something, plant a seed, they start to improve their health a little bit, start to get some traction, and then if they need some assistance, they might take some action with that. And that's much of what we want to be here for. We want to educate people, get them to take action on those things, much of which you need to do on your own. But we also want to be a, a, a source for people that might be struggling in some ways beyond that. So if you're not already a nutrition response testing uh, uh, patient, which you know, most of you seem like you already understand what that is, uh, please uh, realize inside there we have a little you know, survey form, okay? Take a moment before you leave, okay? And actually, if you would, even if you are a patient, I still encourage you to fill that out for me. Because we design our lectures based off of what people want to hear about. Okay, not because what we want to talk about, but because what people want to hear about. Okay, it's a little. Can I just see that for a second? Uh, yeah. Okay, it's a public education workshop screening form. Okay, fill that out, please. If you fill that out and uh, turn it into us, if you're not a patient, okay, already, we basically donate a certain amount of our services each and every year because we belong to the Wellness Education Foundation. It's a, it's a lecturing arm which helps alternative doctors to go out into the community to educate people. The lectures are always free and we donate a certain amount of services that we're able to do so to assist people with their health. So with the nutrition response testing, if you basically fill that out and you know talk to one of the ladies downstairs before you leave, you can get an initial examination in our office it's a full hour and a half long visit at no charge, okay? That's our gift back to you because we thank you for getting educated on that. If you have loved ones that are maybe either going to be starting that or want to start that, save them $120, okay? Bring them to a lecture. An hour to an hour and a half of their time is worth saving that much money. If you refer them, it's $60, but it's still $60 less they would have to spend for that first visit if they wanted to come into that. People that are out there in cyber world, okay, same thing applies if you call us. We will honor, obviously, hearing this lecture, just you know, reference it by calling the office, 433-9661. That's my little plug to the people out there. If there's anyone even logged in, because we started late. So I don't know how this whole thing works. All right, but ultimately, um, that's our, our mission, and we really want to educate people. And I definitely encourage people, if there's anything that you heard that makes sense to you, and you're going to maybe apply certain things, and there's people around you that you care for, friends or family, there's certain topics that people don't like to talk to to others because they feel like they're kind of putting their beliefs on other people. All right, if living a happier, healthier, longer life is a belief that anyone you're talking to doesn't agree with, after you smack them a few times, okay, just joking, okay, <laughs> keep talking about those things because it's important for people to understand the simple concepts. It's not like you have to be some vegan, you know, you know, sitting in the lotus position, prayer, you know, you know meditative warrior you know, for life to be a health healthy person, simple little things done consistently over time will make a major difference. My dad lived an extra 33 years because he made simple changes, but then he also made some radical changes because the simple changes started to make the difference. And I encourage people to do that same thing because no matter where you're at with your health journey, in most cases, you're not quite as bad off as my dad was. And you can live a lot longer, but you can also have a lot more life in those years that you have. And that's the, the thing. It's not just about duration. It's about enjoying the years that you have. So please take action. Fill out those surveys for me as well so I can figure out you know, what else we can talk about in the future. And if you have any questions beyond this thing ending, um, I'll stick around for a few minutes. And thank you. If you didn't know that, this is my birthday today. So I'm not saying that for – thank you for that. It's not necessarily for that purpose, but it meant so much for me to continue. Every two weeks we do our lecture. They didn't want to miss that tonight because it's my birthday. So uh, I wanted to make sure of that. So if I'm willing to give you time on my birthday – Go take some time and share some information with people afterwards. If uh, if they do anything like social media and things like that, we have videos that we're continuing to put out, okay? Uh, YouTube is going to be a much bigger avenue because we like to lecture, but we realize a lot of people don't come out to lecture. So if we can put those things out there, some simple things, go to our YouTube uh, site at Southside uh, Chiropractic. And if you subscribe to it, you'll see a whole bunch of health hacks that we put out there over the last uh, – um, 
few months that are just simple things you can apply. I won't go into what they're all about, but definitely do that. We're going to do more with stretching and different things like that that people can apply. And there's a billion things out there, but what our mission is is to basically what we call sorting through the noise. There's so much now. Back when my dad was having an issue, he couldn't find information. Now there's so much, what do I believe? Okay, so we want to help people sort through the noise and use the principles of basic health principles, you know, and to put them into practice. Okay, does that make sense? So subscribe to that. If you're on Facebook, go check us out there too. But we're going to try to do a lot more with that. Not because I'm a social media guy myself, but other people are. So, hey, that's a good way to hear about it, okay? I'm exhausted. Thank you. I'm also older, so I don't have as much stamina as I did yesterday. So appreciate your time. Have a good night, guys. And we got to figure out how to shut this thing off. Good night. Thank you very much.